Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Happy to have you all with us and delighted to welcome back our guest speaker today, Dr. Corey Tapper, um, who is an assistant professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins in the area of uh, palliative medicine and medical education. Uh, many of you remember him from his time as a resident here, so always happy to uh, welcome him back, resident and chief resident. Uh, he did his uh, fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine at UPMC and also got an MS in medical education at that time. He's now the associate program director for the hospice and palliative medicine fellowship program at Johns Hopkins. And we are delighted to have him with us, Dr. Tapper. Thank you so much, Dr. Weissman. And, and thank you everyone else uh, for having me. Oh, hi, Dr. Is. Um, My goodness, you're getting thunderous applause here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am very happy to be here. Um, I am going to um, be speaking to you guys a little bit about one of my secondary, well, well, sometimes it's even my primary passion, medical education, which is a passion that I actually feel that I um, first figured out when I was a chief resident at Beth Israel. Um, so I'm very happy to be home. Uh, I will share my screen. So what I'd like to teach or speak to you about today is serious illness communication skills. And I'll take you through some of the evidence for why this is important. And we'll also speak about um, some of the basic core tools uh, that you as internists and as residents, uh, as hospitalists can be using. Um, I do not have any relevant financial relationships to disclose. My objectives for the talk is that by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that you'll be able to do the following through looking at evidence, and we're also going to look at some videos. So recognizing reasons why communication skills training is essential, uh, describing how ineffective communication affects our patients and us. Uh, we'll look at skills to deliver serious news, and we'll also recognize phrases used in eliciting patient values. Um, for anyone who would like to put in um, or ask questions, I should say, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will uh, periodically be looking at it um, and we'll also listen to some um, and watch some videos throughout the talk. Um, for the first half though, I'm actually gonna speak to you a little bit about the evidence for communication skills training. And I'll begin by setting the stage. So we will, um, go through the who, what, when, where, and why, although not in that partic not necessarily in that particular order, pertaining to the utility of serious illness communication skills training. Um, let's start with the what. So in the past, it was commonly assumed that communication skills were innate. You are either a good communicator or a bad communicator. And it was assumed that these communication skills really can't be learned. We now know though that this could not be further from the truth. So certainly communication skills can be successfully learned whether or not you have a solid baseline of innate skills. So if communication skills um, for use in serious illness specifically can be learned, surely we must be training medical professionals in this domain and not just the palliative care professionals. And the good news is uh, we are, and we will go over that um, over the next few minutes. First, I would like to show you what effects that ineffective communication have on both us and our patients and, our, and their families. So if we look first at the patient and loved one perspective, if we as clinicians are not effectively communicating with them, we run the risk of eroding trust. We can also create false hope with our patients and their loved ones. And through creating false hope, that can actually complicate things like grief and coping, uh, and not just at the end of life. It can also happen before that also. And in the worst case scenario, we can actually be creating tangible harm for our patients and their loved ones when we're using ineffective communication techniques. It also has effects on us as clinicians. Um, a lot has been spoken about, not just in GME, but in the medical world at large over the last several years about burnout. And ineffective communication plays into this somewhat. 
uh, it can certainly lead to conflict among providers. So, you know, it is absolutely okay for different medical providers to have different ideas and different opinions about where a patient might be in their illness course. However, if we can't all get on the same page and give a unified message to our patients, that can certainly lead to conflict among us. And in the worst case scenario, if we're not effectively communicating among ourselves, that can of course lead to actual medical errors. So what does it actually look like to our patients and to everyone else around us when we are communicating ineffectively? First, we might come off as mechanistic or robotic. Maybe we're just going through the motions. Perhaps we're using that complex language that we call jargon that our patients can't quite understand. Maybe we are rambling and going on and on and not getting to the point that we want to be getting to. Um, that is very related to maybe using tangential speech. So we're beating around the bush, but not getting to the main points. Ignoring emotion is a big one. So we as clinicians can sometimes be really good at delivering information and at the same time, not recognizing that our patients and their loved ones are having reactions to that. And if we ignore it, um, that is going to have downstream effects. And sometimes we go into these conversations with our patients and have our own personal agenda. And while having our own personal agenda is absolutely fine, we also need to, at the same time, take a step back and incorporate our patient's agenda into this entire paradigm. So I'm going to take you through some of the various curricula that have been used for specifically this purpose. And these three bullet points here are just some of the outcomes of communication skills training for various medical professionals. So when we get training on this, we become more confident, which should not be hard to realize. We actually have looked at patient satisfaction scores. And when we use good communication with our patients, their satisfaction improves. And we actually know that this has more tangible benefits when we're actually thinking about patient and loved one's mental health. In addition, good communication can help to build trust uh, and build reputation and even decrease litigation. Sometimes we call these skills our quote unquote primary palliative care skills. And in all fairness though, perhaps a better paradigm would be advocating for teaching of serious illness communication skills as a core component of the education for all medical professionals. So the who in this paradigm here is you and every other medical professional who you are working with. These are just some of the curricula that have been previously validated. You can tell by the names of the talks which population that they specifically worked with. And I'm going to walk us through a few of these curricula to tell you exactly what they did and what the measurable outcomes were. So OncoTalk is actually the oldest curriculum that I'm going to share with you. Uh, this was a four-day communication workshop specifically performed with medical oncology fellows aimed at improving communication skills acquisition for delivering serious news. This was a study that was published in um, uh, the archives in 2007. It looked at about 150 fellows and fellows delivered serious news to standardized patients and the primary outcomes were observable participant communication skills that were measured by an outside person during these SP encounters. And this was done both before and after the fellows received didactics on giving bad news and discussing transitions towards a more comfort-related or hospice-oriented plan of care. And the framework that they used there um, were spikes, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, which is a communication framework that you may have heard of, especially for residents in their, um, in, in their medicine training. And on the bottom left, you can see uh, nurse skills. So nurse skills are ways of responding empathically to our patients and their loved ones. And I'm gonna show you this actually a little bit later on. 
Uh, Remap, which is another framework for communication, is something I'll also show you later. What I'd like to specifically draw your attention to here is the skill acquisition for using spikes and responding empathically using those nurse statements after the intervention. And you can see on the right-hand side here, what I've highlighted in red were the statistically significant improvements in the various participant behaviors that were coded. And the majority, seven of the nine, were actually statistically significant improvements. So all but two there in the summary and the understanding. Nephrotalk um, was, is a communication skills training course in the renal population. This was somewhat similar to Oncotalk, a little bit adjusted for their population. It was a three-day curriculum for renal fellows to help improve communication skills acquisition for delivering serious news. This was a curriculum that was published in 2018 um, by educators out of the University of Pittsburgh. And fellows delivered serious news to standardized patients before and after having didactics on spikes and remap. And they looked, and they also received the didactic, by the way, on conflict nego negotiation, which is something that comes up frequently. The curriculum itself measured self-reported preparedness for goals of care and transitions at the end of life. And the SP encounters were audio recorded and evaluated using a communication checklist. Um, similar to Oncotalk, they, they measured nine different skills. And while skill use increased post-training in all nine skills measured, the difference was statistically significant in the seven skills highlighted here in the box. And what I found to be really interesting in this study was that the more the fellows used these skills, the average duration of all of the simulated patient encounters were actually statistically significantly shorter after the training. So what this tells me is that by investing in this type of training, we may ultimately save time for both clinicians and patients. That's something that really comes up a lot when we speak about medical education and curriculum is where do we get the time for these types of things? Um, this is from the same curriculum. So they looked at the fellows self-reported preparedness on a five point Likert scale. And the fellows reported improved preparedness in really all of the domains that they looked at. And the fellows felt really strongly about this, that they actually felt that this curriculum should be mandatory for future fellows. I do wanna highlight that many of our educational tools have dramatically changed over the last two years, especially as it pertains to virtual learning. And at first glance, it would appear that teaching communication skills virtually would be extraordinarily challenging. And I myself have had personal experience teaching communication skills virtually using simulated patients over the last two years and can attest that it is quite comparable to in-person learning. Of course, there are changes and differences. I do wanna give you though some objective evidence here. So Jerry Talk was actually one of the first serious illness communication skills curricula that was developed. And during the pandemic, the curriculum was adjusted for the virtual format. This curriculum was actually published by your very own palliative medicine faculty at Beth Israel and, and Sinai at large in uh, last year in 2021. And you may recognize some of the names here. Uh, so Dr. Lindenberger, uh, Dr. Friedman, and in this curriculum, geriatrics fellows received didactics and subsequently performed virtual simulated patient encounters. And in this figure that I'm showing here, you can see learner reported preparedness. The blue denotes the previous in-person courses and the pink is the new virtual course. And in all query domains, self-reported preparedness was comparable to the in-person course. They also asked some other survey questions and compared it to the previous curricula that was done in person, where you can see a lot of the answers here really are comparable. So look, working in small groups, looking at the educational quality of the program, whether or not this would be recommend, recommended for other fellows. So what I hope that I've been able to show you with these last three curriculum is that 
there are tangible benefits from these types of training programs. I do wanna point out other types of work that have been done in this space that are not exactly um, the same as, formu as uh, formalized retreats. This was a QI project that I was fortunate enough to be involved with at the University of Pittsburgh during my own fellowship. And we worked with upper level internal medicine residents during one of their inpatient hospitalist rotations. And the initiative consisted of giving two didactics on um, communication skills, followed by coaching sessions on real-time palliative questions that were coming up on the team's rounding and patient care. So we would actually do these coaching sessions with internal medicine residents three times a week for 15 or 20 minutes uh, each session over the span of 14 months. And we collected pre and post rotation surveys on their preparedness in discussing various palliative care and advanced care planning topics. We then actually were able to query the EMR and other documentation records to track the rate of goals of care discussions. So this is a table depicting the preparedness in various palliative care topics, both pre and post the intervention. And you can see that preparedness increased significantly across all topics with the, ex with the exception of established reports, that very first one there. I will highlight that the greatest increases were in eliciting how patients would like surrogates to approach decisions, uh, eliciting patients' fears about the end of life, helping patients to ask care providers questions, helping patients complete advanced directives, and also helping patients talk to their families about what the future might be like. This is another figure from that same QI project, and it's looking at the pre-hospital versus pre-discharge percentage of at-risk patients with documented goals of care conversations over the course of the intervention. We happen to define at-risk patients which was anyone who was 65 years old with two or more hospitalizations within the last six months or any patient uh, over the age of 90. What I've highlighted here in red is the six months pre-intervention. There was a 5.2% of our patients that actually had documented goals of care discussions before hospitalization. And that increased to 25% before they were ultimately discharged. The intervention itself began in June of 2017 and went on for 14 months after that. So during the intervention, the percentage of pre-discharge goals of care documentation actually increased to 57.3%. So we were really happy with those results that we were able to get through this coaching. I wanna mention one final reason why this type of training is important before I move on to the second half of what I'd like to speak to everyone about. Um, we as palliative care specialists love and are honored to, to help with any type of family meetings and goals of care discussions and advanced care planning, and of course, end of life decisions with our patients. However, we have our own limitations to consider also. In 2017, Arif Kamal, who is a medical oncologist and, and palliative care specialist at Duke, um, surveyed palliative medicine physicians who were members of AHPM, which is our largest national palliative care organization. And they, the survey collected data on the palliative care physician workforce. Um, and it looked at our workforce and it also looked at burnout. And this figure plots the available palliative care physician workforce based on the year when respondents are anticipated to leave the field, either to move on to something else or to retire. So what we can see here is there is already a palliative care physician workforce shortage, and this is actually projected to get worse over the next three decades. So when, or over the next, I guess we could say two decades now. Um, if you look all the way at the right-hand side here, this is plotted out to 2030. 
And what we actually know, what is projected right now is that by 2030, um, we expect that there's only going to be one palliative care physician for every 26,000 patients who would traditionally benefit from a palliative care consultation. So the bottom line that I'm trying to convey here is that we in palliative care are going to be relying on other medical specialists and professionals to learn and effectively utilize some of these communication skills um, when it comes to patients who have various serious and chronic illnesses. So I am going to transition to speaking a little bit about some of the core tools. Um, hopefully I've been able to impress upon you how much I love curricula and medical education, and that is what I spend a lot of my time doing. So I'm going to use that opportunity to actually teach you guys that. Before I do that, I, I do see maybe one or two things in the chat. So I'll just check here. So for spikes, did they look at using the word cancer before a definitive diagnosis, such as pre-biopsy, or was this after definitive diagnosis? So that's a really good question, Dr. Berger. This happened to be after diagnosis um, that they were looking at with the oncology fellows um, in their simulated patient encounters. Um, more and more, we are looking at ways that we can actually teach these skills for learners at varying time points of a patient's illness. And actually, um, some of my colleagues and I here at Hopkins have recently got buy-in from our own medical oncology fellowship to do a virtual communication skills workshop. And what we plan on doing is using simulated patients at different time points in their illness. So we are gonna look at presentation before their diagnosis, um, and actually follow that forward um, until a patient um, is nearing the end of life and perhaps is not a candidate for future therapies or perhaps does not want future therapies. So what we're hoping to do with that is exactly what Dr. Berger just said is look at some of the language that we're using. Um, we want to, of course, limit jargon at the same time, we also wanna make sure that we are really careful and direct with the words that we're using. So it's important, um, which I think what Dr. Berger is alluding to, it is important to use the word cancer. It is important to use the word end stage heart failure. It is important to use the word dying um, as opposed to using um, euphemisms or, or other non-specific language, unless there is a specific patient cultural reason not to. Thank you for that question. So we'll go a little bit into some of the core tools that all of you can use, and certainly I hope that um, the residents can use. I'm first going to start with just showing you the spikes paradigm. This is what I assume that some of you have already seen in the past. This is a framework for delivering serious news. So we talk about, you know, we actually wanna start thinking about this before we actually get into the room and start having a family meeting with a patient and their loved ones. We actually wanna make sure we do all of our pre-work. So we wanna make sure that we have all stakeholders involved for a particular family meeting. Do I, as um, the primary team, have everyone here that I want to for this meeting? Have we answered all of the questions that are likely to come up in this meeting so that we can actually deliver this to patients? We can use this as an opportunity um, to, I call it pre-briefing. So before we even go in the room, uh, deciding who is going to um, control which parts of the conversation, who is gonna deliver news, who's gonna do other parts, making sure we are all on the same page. Um, of course, there is also video teleconferencing etiquette. So, you know, hopefully we've now recently been able to do more family meetings over the last two years, though, we've been having family meetings over the phone or over Zoom or other, or other um, teleconferencing method. And there are different techniques to use when we are working in the virtual space because 
using things like therapeutic touch or other, um, other types of um, ways that we can connect with patients is limited over teleconference when we are not actually there in person. The P in spikes is for perception. So this is our opportunity to actually learn about what a patient's understanding is uh, of their illness. I think it's really important at the very beginning, after we introduce everyone in the room, ask the patient, hey, what do you understand about what's been going on with your cancer? Or tell me what the doctors have most recently told you about your kidney disease. And what I like about that is it gives control of the conversation to the patient. And it also gives me the opportunity to get their baseline, understand what they know so that I can fill in any details that they missed and also gives me an opportunity right away to correct anything that they may have gotten wrong. Um, the I in spikes is for invitation. So before we deliver serious news, it's really important to ask permission to do that um, so that the patient is not caught off guard. Some patients don't want to know the news. Um, most of our patients do. Other patients prefer us to speak to other members of their family or, or their healthcare agent. Um, the the knowledge part in spikes is, is when we're actually gonna give the new information. I call that a headline, and we'll speak more about a headline in a few slides, but that's our way of delivering new news in a really direct and concise way. Um, the E is for addressing emotion. We're gonna talk about nurse statements and how we actually address that in a few slides. And then the S is for our strategizing and summarizing. So we wanna tie everything in a bow, hopefully at the end of our con conversation to make sure that patient and loved ones understand what we've been speaking about and that we can all again be on the same page. Remap is, some, is another communication framework that we use very commonly in palliative care. A lot of this is similar to what we've already discussed in Spikes with a few differences. So I'm not gonna spend quite as much time here. So the reframe, uh, which is our R, this is when I'm gonna, this is like the K in Spikes. So I'm gonna be giving my new news, explaining why the status quo isn't working, what has changed. My E is the same that expecting and responding to emotion. Mapping the future RM is going to be my chance to actually learn about what's important to a patient. This is when I'm going to really drill down on what their values and beliefs are, their goals of care, we might call it. Um, aligning is our A. So this is another way of summarizing. And then we're going to develop a plan. What I've done here is put spikes and remaps side by side. What I'm highlighting is where there are actual um, similarities. So the knowledge and the, of spikes and the, and the reframe of remap are essentially the same thing. You can see on spikes, what is left out of remap is that whole planning phase and actually gaining the patient's perception. And what's different in remap, which is what I, as a palliative care doctor, spend a lot of time with my patients doing, is that mapping the future. So really drilling down on what their goals and values are. I spent a few minutes or a few moments um, on the last two slides discussing a headline. So a headline is gonna be that new information that we are giving to patients and their loved ones. This is a really important step. And what we want to do here is deliver this new information in as concise and direct a way as possible. This should really be the key piece of information that you want your patient to take away from the conversation. And really it should be one to two sentences maximum. So examples of headlines would be, the CT scan shows that the cancer has gotten worse or Despite the chemotherapy, the cancer continues to spread. Now, sometimes people like to start their headline with a warning shot. 
So it's kind of our way of making sure that they know serious news is coming. And there's, there's no right or wrong way. And in fact, I tell my learners to practice uh, both ways and see what works for them. And in different scenarios, you might use a warning shot. In others, you might not. So here's an example of warning shots. Unfortunately, I have bad news or I have something serious we need to discuss. So if we put it together, an example would be, I have some serious news to discuss. The CT scan shows that the cancer has gotten worse. After the headline, your immediate reaction as the clinician should actually be to stop. This is really hard for us as clinicians. We are medical doctors. We are other medical professionals. We love to give new information and to talk to our patients. And silence can actually be really uncomfortable for us. However, after we give that new information, we actually need to give a few seconds for our patients to actually process the news that we just told them. These last two skills that I've gone over here, the headline and then allowing for silence after that, sounds on its face really simple. In all actuality, it's actually quite challenging and something that I do with my learners um, for the first six months of their fellowship is actually have them write down their headlines on their rounding sheet. And I have them practice, even if they're not preparing for a family meeting or planning on giving serious news that day, we practice developing headlines to give to our patients just in case we were actually in that scenario. Because even though it's just one to two sentences, it's actually quite complex. And for us can actually instill a lot of anxiety. It's not easy to do this. What I would like to do now is I'm going to show a video, which is about a minute long. And what we're doing here is highlighting specific skills. This video specifically is going to look at giving or delivering that headline. Um, this is similar to what you might experience in a simulated patient encounter if you were to ever do this in the future. What I would like you guys to do, um, and this is open to everyone, I, I especially wanna encourage residents to participate in this. I'd like you to use the chat function. And during the video, type in the chat specific words that the clinician, here we're gonna be working with Dr. Bale, that he's using when giving a headline. And after the video, I'll stop and have a look at the chat. So unfortunately, I do have some bad results for you and that the cancer has come back in both the uh, liver and the lungs, I'm sorry to say. I know this is a real shock to you and we were hoping for a better result. I, I don't even know what to say. I'm. I understand it's really very difficult to hear this. It's certainly not what I came in here thinking I'd hear today. I wish that the results could have been better for you. All right. So if you'd like, you guys can still continue to, to add to the chat there. So we had Dr. Bale and Brenda Lewis. Um, so I'm seeing some people putting in, right, uh, unfortunately, right? So the headline that we got there from Dr. Bale, we actually received a warning shot. Dr. Bale said, unfortunately, I do have some bad results for you. Followed by the headline, the cancer has come back in the liver and the lungs, I'm sorry to say. And then, oh good, I'm seeing a, a nice uh, entry here, uh, an I wish statement, which I think is really great. Um, 
So Dr. Bale allowed for some silence. And Brenda Lewis, who's our patient, came back and she said, oh my goodness, I don't even know what to say. And then Dr. Bale said, I wish the results could have been better for you. And that's actually a specific type of empathic statement that um, we'll talk about in a few slides because it actually allows us to align with patients. Yeah, so I understand, absolutely. Thank you for, um, for participating in that. We'll have one or two more videos to do the same. So when we are delivering serious news, we've already gone through the first few steps here. So, uh, or we spoke about them before, I should say. So we got ready before this conversation, right? We went into the room, we had everyone we want there. We know who's gonna do what. We elicit the patient's understanding. Then we give them that headline. And what we saw in that last video at the very end was Dr. Bale responding empathically. What I want you guys to take away from that video is after you give a headline, after you give news to a patient, you real, and you allow for silence, you really should get some sort of emotion. And the emotion can be anything. It can be sadness. It can be shock. It can be anger. It can be defiance. As long as you get an emotion. If you get an emotion, that means that the patient heard you. They heard you. They're starting to process what you just said. If, on the other hand, um, you don't get any emotion and you kind of get blank stares, even after allowing for that silence, then chances are you might have to try again because your headline wasn't completely effective. Let's assume, though, that your headline was effective and you allow for silence and now it's time to actually respond to the emotion. We have a mnemonic for this called nurse. And I like to think of this in um, going from top to bottom, kind of an escalating complexity. And what I like my learners to do is when they're very first learning how to respond to emotion, is to actually memorize some of these phrases and keep one of each type of emotion in their back pocket that you can pull out at any time because you've kind of memorized it. Again, these communication skills don't necessarily come innately to us. So responding to emotion may not be something that we are innately comfortable with. This is where the practice comes in. Um, and then once you memorize and start to use these skills, these statements, you will become more comfortable with them. And you will then be able to expand the types of empathic statements that, that you're using. And it's not going to sound quite as rote. So for N, which is our naming, this is really as easy as it sounds. This is you as the clinician are recognizing and that the patient is having an emotion and you are just parroting it back to them. It is clear how sad this is making you. Another way um, to say something similar, I'm sure this is shocking to you. What this is doing is showing the patient that you're actually listening. You recognize that emotion. Understanding statements. So here's an example. I cannot imagine what you're going through. Another example would be, I understand this is not what you were expecting to hear. I really particularly like the next two, so respecting and supporting statements. I use these a lot. I like respecting statements because I think it actually elevates the patient and their loved ones. So um, if I'm speaking to um, a healthcare agent or, or a surrogate decision maker, he's saying something like, you are being a fantastic advocate for your mom. Um, or if I'm speaking to a patient, I might say, you have done everything your medical team has asked of you. Uh, supporting statements. So my team will be here for you during this process. Um, I leave it up to you in terms of whether you're going to use the first person or the third person here. I myself, I practice inpatient palliative care. So once my patients leave the hospital, I may not actually see them again. So I prefer for myself to use the third person. Um, my team is going to be here for you. Um, 
as opposed to, I am going to be here for you because the last thing I want is to never see this patient again and then have my patient potentially feel abandoned that um, I'm not seeing them again and providing them that support once they leave the hospital. However, if you are going to have continuity with your patient, whether it be in the inpatient or the outpatient realm, using the first person here is absolutely appropriate. And then exploring. Um, these are kind of ways to get to the next step and really trying to delve a little bit more into someone's mind. Now that you've heard this news, I wonder what worries you have, or I wonder what's going through your mind. So it's kind of asking them to be a little bit more active in the conversation. So if we were to look here at the remap again, so we've already been through the R for reframe. We just went over our nurse statements for our emotion. And what we're going to delve into for a few minutes is what I spend a lot of my time doing, mapping the future. So this is my opportunity to figure out what's important to a person. What do they hope to, av to avoid in the future? What are their values? So we call this their goals of care, right? So the, 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 what we're trying to do here is use open-ended questions to try to get to the heart of what is important to a person. And as a rule of thumb, we want to ask at least three questions, although in all reality and in most scenarios, it's going to be more than that. And this may, by the way, happen over more than one encounter. You might not have this full conversation all in one sitting. As I'm just getting to learn someone, I'm going to use really open-ended questions. And the more I get to know them, the more direct and closed-ended I'm able to make some of my questions. I'm going to give you some examples of mapping questions that I use with my patients. I won't read all of them. I'll allow you to read as you like. I do want to highlight a few of them for you. So the first one there, tell me what life was like six months before you got sick, which I know technically isn't even a question. What I'm trying to get at here is understanding a little bit more about what this person was like at their baseline. Knowing what they were like at their baseline is actually going to help me down the road figure out how close to that baseline we might get a specific patient back to. If they are at an, a, a less advanced stage of their disease, maybe we can get them pretty close to their baseline. Um, if they're further along in their disease process, maybe that's not going to be the case. And that information is going to help me to set both short and long-term goals for my patients. Um, when you think about the future, what worries or concerns you? Or also the flip side of that, what's important to you? I also particularly like, what do you hope to accomplish with the time you have left? The last one here, which I colored in a uh, different way, um, and I did that on purpose because this is a question that I would ask of a surrogate decision maker, for example, or a healthcare agent, if the patient is incapacitated for whatever reason, maybe they have delirium or advanced dementia, or maybe they're in the ICU and sedated because they're intubated and mechanically ventilated. So I can't rely on the patient for information. So I'll ask if your mom or your dad were able to participate in this conversation, what would she say about what's going on in her health? And I word that question very deliberately in that way. It is extraordinarily challenging for loved ones to make decisions for patients because they don't wanna do the wrong thing. They don't wanna be the person who's responsible for something bad happening. So when I'm speaking about goals, I specifically want surrogates to think about what the patient would actually want if they were able to speak for themselves, not what the surrogate themselves would want for the patient. We kind of want to take them out of that equation. And hopefully that will help to reduce 
some of the guilt and trepidation that they might otherwise experience. These are just more examples of the same thing. So prior to mom getting sick, what was her life like? What discussions did you have? Um, what I'm gonna do now is show another video. This one's a little bit longer. It's about two minutes long. We're gonna be working with Dr. Uh, with uh, Brenda Lewis who is gonna be our patient again. Um, we're actually gonna be working with a different doctor this time, um, Dr. Tulski. I'm gonna ask you guys to do the same thing again. Um, use the chat. And in this case, what I'd like you to do is type in the mapping questions that you hear the physician use during this video. I guess I expected the scans to be even worse. So uh, what do we do now? That's a good question. And actually, I'm going to answer that question, and we'll talk about what the plan can be. Mm -hmm. But first, to help with that, it would be really useful for me to know if it turned out that time was limited, what's most important to you right now? I, I honestly haven't even faced that question mm -hmm. for myself. Well, tell me what, what things are most important as far as what you care about or what would you like to be doing? I'd like to get away from all this and not be doing testing and being in hospitals and being around doctors. Yeah. Nothing personal. I, I wish I could just go away, go on a trip someplace and just enjoy life for a while. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? What would enjoying your life really look like? <sighs> Sitting on a beach, reading a big fat novel slowly, <sighs> listening to music, <sighs> just having fun and not having to think about this. Yeah, those are great things. It sounds like those are things that you haven't been able to do or think about in a long time. And are those things that I can do? I think that there's a lot there that we can work on. All right, great, I'll look at the chat now. Yeah, so you're seeing a lot of really nice things here. So, um, Yep, as Dr. Berger said at the very beginning, a great way of stating that he'll answer her questions, but first want to explore the goals first. So that's really great. We want to make sure um, that we make it absolutely clear that we're actually going to answer a patient's question. It, we're just not going to answer it right away. That's really nice. So what's most important for you? Absolutely. Um, what, would you uh, what would that look like for you? Really great. And what would enjoying your life look like? I specifically want to point that one out. Um, what you may have noticed there is Dr. Tulski actually used the patient's words to develop that question. She said, I want to enjoy life. And he used that, he kind of latched onto that word enjoy and flipped that into a question as a way of getting her to tell him more. What would enjoying your life look like? Absolutely. Yep. So what would you want to work on? There's a lot we could look at. Um, right. So that this is patient centered. Yep. And that's a lot. Thank you, Dr. Risk, for that comment. Um, when I think about communication, especially when I'm in the room as the palliative care doctor, I actually view it as a success when I, as the palliative care doctor, don't have to say very much in the room. I'm actually much more happy and fulfilled when the patient and their loved ones are, as, are able to have as much control of the conversation as possible and using someone like me as more of a facilitator of the conversation. I do wanna highlight one thing here before I move on to my very last few slides is some of you may be thinking that, oh my goodness, 
this seems really artificial. I, I want to call that out right at the right from the outset. Um, and you're not wrong. These videos are are not meant to be exactly um, real time and real patient scenarios. What they more are meant to do is just highlight some of the skills that we may be using. Because of course, this conversation is not going to unfold with a real patient in just the two minutes that this encounter did. Um, I'm hopeful that you're able to take away those, some of those concrete skills that you can use in the real world. So I do have just a couple more slides left. We're going to finish up with the A and the P of remap. So aligning with the patient's values, this is kind of my way of summarizing. So this is how I'm going to summarize everything that I've learned. And what that does is allow the patient to correct me if I got anything wrong. And then once I do that, I can actually move on to the plan. Um, patients always want us to do things for them. So when I'm actually discussing a plan and making a recommendation, I first tell them about the things that we will do. And then afterwards, I'll tell them about the things that we won't do. And then of course, ask them what they feel about the plan. Is that, you know, maybe they agree with all of it. Maybe they agree with some of it. Maybe they don't agree with any of it. And then we can get into some negotiation. And to highlight that for just a moment, we're gonna watch one last video. You do not need to use the comments here. I just want you to focus on, um, on hearing what's going on in this video. It's just a minute long. And this is gonna take us quickly through aligning and making a recommendation with a different set of actors. What I heard you say is that if we could give you more antibiotics and get you home, you'd like to live at home as long as you can. Yes, I want to stay at home. And I also heard you say that you don't want to be stuck on a machine. <laughs> yeah, when it's my time to go, I want to go peacefully. May I make a recommendation? Sure. We ought to keep you on the treatments you're on now and try to get you home. There's a good chance that will work. And once you're at home, we should focus on keeping you at home. Yeah, that sounds good. If you got worse and had to be put on machines, I don't think I could get you off them. So I don't think we should do that. Does that sound right? Yes. So in a very, very short time period there, they kind of labeled the steps for you as, as the doctor was taking them. So she first aligned. What I heard is, I don't want to be on machines. I want to be at home. And then before actually moving on to giving a recommendation, the doctor first asked for permission. And then she made the recommendation separated by the things we will do and then the things we won't do. And of course, she then checked in. Does that sound right? So those are all the steps that we should be taking when we're actually giving a recommendation. So I am going to conclude now. So over the last 50 minutes or so, we went over the rationale and evidence for communication skills training. We spoke about how these are not necessarily innate skills. They can be learned. We talked about some of those different curricula. I briefly mentioned the workforce shortages and palliative care as a as one ancillary reason why this type of training would be helpful. And then we went briefly through some of those frameworks for delivering serious news, uh, namely the spikes and remap. And I will end there um, and, I'll, and I'm happy to take any questions and I'll stop share so I could see everyone. Um, thanks so much for that uh, really interesting talk. We'll let people uh, unmute and ask questions or uh, put their comments in the chat. We have about five minutes to take a couple of questions. I, by the way, am loving seeing all of the teams. I assume that they're analogous to when I was there, all the team numbers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes.
So, you know, as you guys may have may realize, um, the second half of the talk, when I went through some of those core skills, that really was just a very, very quick rundown of some of the things we do. This was not meant to be an exhaustive communication skills course. Um, I, I just was hoping to give you guys some tangible points that you can take with you to the floors. Oh, yep, Dr. Dr. Brisk has a question, yep. First of all, I am so proud of you. It's so good to see you. I'm very, very impressed. Um, and thank you for coming and doing this talk. I have a question. You know, we have so many patients now with multi-organ stuff. And, you know, a lot of times multiple specialists are involved and there might be differences of opinions. And also at times even confusing for families. Yeah. Just speaking personally, as an example, my own dad you know, didn't want dialysis at the end of his life. And the nephrologist was pushing it and that completely confused my mom. And, you yeah. know, and I felt like I had to be the voice of reason to really try to abide by his own personal wishes, mm -hmm. um, despite the nephrologist's push to say, well, this will help you. So I just, I feel like a lot of, you know, the complexity of care now is like, because of all of the options available and how many specialists are involved, um, do you have any advice um, for doctors and families on how to kind of push through that? Yeah. Um, the first thing that I would say there is, because I absolutely agree with you, this comes up not only on our general medicine floors, but of course it comes up in the ICU setting also. Um, I see this actually not uncommonly, unfortunately, in the oncology world where um, the patient's primary issue may have been their malignancy. And then they come into the hospital with sepsis or, or a complication of their, of their therapy. And all of a sudden there are other organs that are failing. And, and sometimes the oncologist only likes to deal with, okay, the cancer is stable and we have all these other things. Now you guys can deal with this. So how do we deal with that? Um, one, I think that is where the biggest responsibility is placed on you guys as the primary team as the medicine folks in the room to synthesize all of the various prognoses from the different um, aspects of the patient's illness and come up with a reasonable prognosis. This is really hard, right? Because when we're developing prognosis, we are not, we cannot develop prognosis for a specific individual patient. When we're developing prognosis, we are developing a prognosis based on patients that we've seen with similar characteristics in the past. Um, I would encourage you to get palliative care involved at that point because palliative, what I spend a lot of my time doing is looking at that big picture and helping to develop prognosis and then me taking the responsibility for that. Um, the other concrete thing actually that I have found really helpful is using best case, worst case, most likely scenarios. So here's our best case, here's our worst case, and we may meet somewhere in the middle. And actually sometimes what people will do is write that as a continuum, kind of on like a Likert scale, worst case on this side, best case on this side, and actually star where we think is gonna be most likely in the middle. And explain to patients and families that that star may actually move over the course of their illness because that's how, um, Un unpredictable it can be sometimes. And what I'm actually going to do is in the chat, whoops, if you're hearing um, my sound, I apologize. I'm going to put in the chat a YouTube video of best case, worst case that I actually find really helpful. Um, and I'm happy to take, did that answer your question, Dr. Risk? It did. And that's actually a really good tool, I think, best case, worst case, because it kind of takes that, you know, I think often patients are asking us for a prediction of like time. They want like, right. how much time do they have? What's the prognosis? Right. Right? So I, the, I like that best case, worst case. The, the other thing that I will say is I never give prognosis as an absolute. I give prognosis as a range. So I might say days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years. Um, and maybe make it a little bit more specific within that only because um, patients will hold you to it or loved ones will hold you to it. So being specific can be a challenge. All right. It's one o'clock. I think we have to stop there. Thank you so much for really uh, getting this conversation going. We really appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Topper. It was amazing talk. I'm going to encourage all residents to like take a look at the recorded video or like later time if they cannot like participate like at this time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good day.